How's it going? I have a question. Are you folks ready to nerd out about community data? Who said no? Are you ready to nerd out about community data? Hell yeah. I think this is how we know we found our tribe. So my argument today is really simple, and it's this, is that we don't have anywhere near the quantity or the quality of data that we need to do our work. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that you're piloting a plane as best as you possibly can. And wouldn't it feel really good to have all of this data to guide you, to know the height, distance, which direction you're going? And now imagine that something happened. And this is all you had. And suddenly you're flying blind. Or maybe you just have this one panel to guide you. My argument is that this is kind of where we're at at the moment for most of us. We don't have anywhere near the, quanti the quantity or the quality of data that we need. And we need better data. We truly, madly, deeply need better data than what we have today. And part of the challenge we have is that the traditional approach we're using, the traditional approach we've been taking to get data so far, has been failing us. And it works a little bit like this. First, we gather all the metrics that we possibly can. And then we take these metrics and we put them in graphs, graphs that we think are going to be pretty and attractive. And then we send that graph to our boss, and we create reports from that. And then we hope our boss reads that data. Sometimes she does. But when you look at the quantity of other reports that are out there, very often she doesn't. And if we want to get better at doing this, we have to begin with the initial question, which is, why do we collect data? Anybody, why do we collect data? What's the one reason we have? You can just shout out the answer. Yes, we collect data so we can make better decisions. And if we want to get the right data, then we have to work backwards from the decisions that we have to make. Because if we get this right, everything else becomes so much easier. And there's a simple framework that we've been using for some clients here. There's many options, but this is something that we think about it. At the strategic level, when we think, how do we connect that data with the strategy? One way of thinking about it is, is the community successful today or not? Because if the community is successful, the, is successful, the strategy should be very different from if it isn't. And then, is the environment changing or not? And by the environment, I mean what's happening in the organization. What's happening in the industry? What's happening outside of the community? Because based upon these kind of things, then you can figure out what you should be working on. What should you prioritize in your community? So if your community is doing well and the environment is quite stable, then you can focus on optimizing what you're doing. You can use that 80-20 rule. You can double down on what's working. You can become best in class. That all makes sense if you're in that situation. But if your community is successful and the environment is changing, then you need to adapt. And you need the data to inform that decision. And that might be changing the goals. It might be changing the platform. Or it might be changing the target audience. Or if your community is not successful and the environment is quite stable, then you have to repair what's going wrong. You have to think about repositioning that community, improving the onboarding or promotion, or God forbid, changing the community team. But we need data to guide these decisions. And so I want to take you through kind of a journey of some of the things you can think about and how we go about doing this. The first thing we usually do is to, is to get an initial performance analysis of a community. What this means is that we look at what's happening in the community, we look at what's happening in the environment, and we collect different metrics to figure out what's really happened here. So by the usual engagement metrics, all the ones that we usually track, but it's the environment data that's really interesting. The number of customers per month, um, the number of questions or support tickets per month, the number of visits or users to the company website. The ROI stuff we'll cover a little bit later on. But once you can combine the engagement data with the environment data, then you can do really fun and really interesting things. Because then you can start answering the questions that you really want to answer. Like, is the community doing as well as it should? Are newcomers more or less likely to participate in the community as they used to? Uh, are members easily able to register for the community? 
Once you begin tracking these metrics internally and externally over time, then you can start doing really fun things. And my favorite part of all of this is that it tells a really interesting story. So here's an example. We worked with a client, I think about a year or so ago, and what they were seeing is a typical data set where the number of questions has declined in that community. And what they were thinking about is how do we get more super users involved? How do we promote the community to more of the audience? But when we began looking at the data, looking at what's happening in that environment, then you can start realizing really interesting things. So we looked at, not only is the number of questions in the community declining, but are the number of questions overall declining? And what we discovered is this, is that the number of questions in the community has declined, but the number of support tickets has risen. And you can see the ratio and how that's changed. What does this tell, this tell you has happened? You can just shout out the answer if you think, if you think you know it. Yeah, we're going to have to do one at a time. Uh, someone over here. <laughs> yeah, you can see what's happened here is that people are now filing support tickets instead of um, on, uh, posting questions in the community. And then you can start thinking about why is that happening? And you can take that next step back. And what's really exciting for me in the work that we do is that we get to be a detective of sorts. We get to look at an issue and start working back from it and figure out what was the cause of that issue. And so we look at the logins and we see the logins to the community have remained relatively the same, but to the main company site, it's risen significantly. And what this tells me is that newcomers aren't having that experience of where they're finding the community. It looks like it's an onboarding issue. It looks like that people aren't able to find the community as easy as they should, and that's what you can focus on. And this is a completely different solution from what they were initially focusing on. And that's why this kind of analysis is really useful, combining the engagement data with the environment uh, information. The second thing is tracking popularity over time. I think one of the most important things that any strategy should do is align you with current trends. And if you want to align with current trends, you have to know what those trends are. You have to know what's happening in the environment so you're aligned to it. Anytime you're fighting trends, you're fighting a tidal wave that you're probably not going to defeat. And so we want to know what parts of the community are rising or falling in popularity. We want to know, uh, is there any major shift in locations that people are coming from? We want to know, are the type of users beginning to change? This kind of data is really interesting to track over time. And so an example here, what we found initially is that people from the USA, I don't know how easy you can read that, but people from the USA initially made up 60 to 75% of the audience. But if you look at what's happened over time, all the way down here, now we figure, wow, that's a lot less than what it used to be. That's less than 50%. And what we have seen in that time is that people from India and the Philippines now represent, what is that, around 40% or so? And they didn't even know it because they weren't tracking this data. And once you know that, then you can start planning that in your strategies as well. Another thing we look at is where are people coming from? The same client we had here was spending more and more time trying to promote the community via newsletters, via social me me media. But when we looked at the data, what we found is that more and more people were coming from search. Every single month, more people were coming by search. So they're focusing on entirely the wrong thing. But because they, had, they didn't have that data, they didn't know it. These kind of things are so useful in the work that we do. So ultimately, what we want to be doing here is doubling down on what's increasing in popularity and reducing time in what is not. The third thing we look at is what we call a segmented analysis. Most of us, I think, have some way of measuring the quality of that community. NPS, CSAT, something like that. Some qualitative metric that we can track over time. But the issue with this is that this is just a surface level metric. What we want to look at is what happens when we go below that surface. Because the community is not a homogenous mass of activity. And so this is an example. What we see here is that we have the uh, response rate on the vertical axis. axis. We have the average time to first response on the horizontal. And what do you notice about this? You can see the helpfulness score. What occurs to you when you look at this data here? Take a second and just shout out your answer. Hopefully one at a time. We'll see how that works. 
Anyone? If you're looking at this data, what do you notice? Speed is key. But what we're looking at here, really, is that it's clear that there are some areas where the community is not doing well and some where it is. And once we can break a community down into all these different chunks, then we can be laser focused in the interventions that we want to do. So in this example with the product two cat category in the community, we can reduce the time to first response by assigning virtual agents to help. With product one, it's clear what the issue is, that we need to increase the response rate, and so we can do that by increasing the visibility of those questions. And then with uh, goal three, with the developers and partners, we can improve the quality of those responses by recruiting more experts here. And what you'll notice is that each of these things are laser focused because we had the data to do it. And this is what's really exciting. Because what you'll see in uh, January 2019 to November 2019, it might be a little bit imperceptible, but actually it's a very significant change in what's happening in the community. Once you go beneath the surface, you can get really interesting insights. Method four is what we call a survivor analysis. I think almost all of us in this room, at some point we've looked at our, at our community and found data that looks a little bit like this, which is most people they visit once and then they don't stick around. Isn't that the most frustrating thing? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could just change that by maybe a percentage point or two? And a lot of people spend a lot of time on automation rules trying to get more people to stick around in a community. But what we've found is that it doesn't work. If you go to a community because something isn't working and you get your answer, it's almost impossible to get you to come back and visit it again. It's the wrong data to be looking at. What is really interesting to look at is this data here, which is each month, if you break it down, what percentage of members are still active that joined in that cohort? And this is where you can think, wow, there's clearly a big change from November to March 2022. And when I look at this, I'm like, well, let's investigate that. What happened between the best month and the worst month? What can we learn from that and then embed that in the journey itself? And that's what's really exciting because when you look at this kind of data, it gives you where to look at, and then you can do the qualitative insights and the metrics and the research to really figure out where you need to improve your community. Method five is benchmarking. One of the things I used to love doing was scraping a lot of data from different kinds of online communities and put them in the chart like this. You'll notice, by the way, that we use bubble charts a lot. I love them because they can display lots of data at once. And it's kind of interesting to see how different communities compare against one another. The challenge is that if you're scraping data, you can't always get the accuracy that you want. The other challenge is that you get kicked off a lot of online communities. So we don't do that as much anymore. What we do now is more of a qualitative subjective view, where we look at who are the competitors to our clients, and we evaluate and benchmark a community against those competitors. Because one of the most persuasive things that we've found to get more support for almost any kind of community isn't just to have a really strong ROI case study. It's to go beyond that and say, how do you compare against your competitors? And I think it lights a certain fire in people, and people get really excited about it. And it also shows you what's possible and where you should be for where you are today. And another thing you can look at is look at the competition for the, your audience's attention. Whatever value your community offers an audience, there's so many other places where people can go to get that value. Instead of filing a question in a community, they might contact customer support. They might go to your documentation, WhatsApp, Reddit groups, or any of the other channels. And when we look at this example, we see here that nothing stands out about the community. At a strategic level, at a data-driven strategic level, there's an issue we have to solve here. We might look at that and think, well, maybe size or reach or the long-tail questions might be something we're focusing on. Maybe it might be access to staff that we want to pursue. But once you can see where else people go to get that value, then you can figure out what your community should be doing. And what we really want to be doing here is doubling down in the areas where the audience interest is really high and where you are strong. And we want to be mitigating the areas where we're weak and we want to be avoiding wasting time in areas where the audience doesn't really care. Method five is when we look at the super users of a community. Usually when we look at super users, the kind of questions we think about is what percentage of questions are answered. 
this is kind of interesting. Um, uh, are there any particular super users we should be investing more time in? All of this is interesting. What is even more interesting from our perspective is to look at the data like this again, a bubble chart. Because what we see here is that there's some super users that are doing well and some that clearly aren't doing so well. What we can see here is that super user 6, super user 20 and 19, they're answering a lot of questions. But they're not answering them especially well. And we can think, well, maybe this program isn't for them. In fact, when you start removing the super users that aren't contributing the right way, what we often find is that it frees up space for other people to step in and answer better, answer better questions in better ways. And this, again, is really useful. And you can see the difference over time between April and November 2019. Really interesting data. And once you get to this level, you can do really specific uh, insights. The second part of this is how we measure value of a community. We've looked at so many metrics where we evaluate the ROI of communities, and honestly, the more we look at it, the more skeptical we become. And if we look at the methods, the methods often um, force you to choose between precision and simplicity and causation and correlation. So the most common one, perhaps, is called deflection. How many of you are measuring this at the moment? Quick show of hands. I can't actually see anyone in the audience, but I assume there's some hands raised. So with core deflection, if you raise your hand, I might be about to upset you. I apologize in advance. But core deflection metrics are largely bogus. And what I mean by that is that the typical way of measuring this is that you calculate how many people visit a question with an answer or an accepted solution. You estimate how many of them were deflected from contacting support. And then you multiply that by the number of people um, or the cost of contacting support. The problem with this is that no one really knows the answer to this, is what percentage of questions were deflected? How would you even begin to measure that? And what we find is that when we look at the real call deflection rate, people have wildly different views. We had one client not too long ago who, when they were sharing their call deflection rate, they said it was 1 in 20. And I was like, well, that's interesting. Where is that number from? Where is that amazing, amazingly specific calculation from? And their answer was, it's the industry standard. And I don't want to be like a jerk, but I feel like I've been in this industry for a while, and I don't sure, I'm not sure it's a standard, or at least the methodology I haven't seen that supports this. And we've seen other organizations that use a method that's closer to one in 500. How accurate can this be if this is the range of answers that we're getting? So what you can do is to run a test. And this is what we did, uh, I think, almost two years ago now. We finally had an organization that wanted to do or were willing to do a controlled test to try and get more support. And it's a really interesting thing to do because you have to be very brave to do it. What we did is that we removed the community from search results for four months, and then we looked at the data to see what happened. And it's the most nerve-wracking thing you can possibly imagine. But finally, we pulled all the data together, we put it into a graph, and this is what it showed. And what this shows is that there is a massive dive in the level of um, people that visit the community. Not to zero, I don't know why people still can visit by search engines. But we also see a spike in the number of tickets that are filed here. And so we calculated, as a result of this, that there's a 58% increase in support tickets. We calculated a 35% increase in response times as a result of the extra level of traffic. We calculated that the customer satisfaction score dropped from 4.3 to 3.8 probably because of the increase in response times. And then we calculated the community was deflecting 163,000 tickets a year and roughly $3 million in savings a year. And I remember posting this on Twitter, and it was the most popular tweet I've ever had. I haven't had that many popular tweets. Um, but I think people missed... Did someone laugh? That's harsh. <laughs> I think people missed a bigger point which is, yes, this is interesting data, and I think it supports a lot of our work. But what we were calculating and what people didn't pay much attention to is that the core deflection rate we were looking at was 1 in 207, not 1 in 20. That's an over 1,000% difference. That's how wild these kinds of metrics are. The other thing we look at here is comparing members to non-members of a community. This is where you can find lots of studies that say people that... Um, uh, uh, 
people in a community bought twice as much or used 33% more of the product compared to people not in the community. But the opposite is true as well. If when you do a sequential analysis of this and see what came first, what you often find is that they were already buying twice as much or they were already using 33% more of your product. And so it's really hard to tell cause and effect. But this doesn't make any of this data bunk. It still has a lot of va value in different ways. A while ago, we did an analysis for the Pragmatic um, Institute. And it was really interesting to look at it, look at all the different behaviors, comparing members to non-members. And pretty much on every value we looked at, people in a community do more or they buy more than people not in a community. But where this data is most interesting, I think, is that it highlights very specifically what behaviors you want to target. What behaviors are most correlated with value that you're trying to drive? And then you can focus these on your strategy. So these metrics, yes, it's not core causation, but it is interesting as well. The final thing we can look at is the Net Promoter Score, or CSAT. This is the other one that tends to come up again and again. The challenge with this is that you can get the same result as comparing members to, against non-members in that community. But if you're going to do it, one way to do this 10 times better than most people are at the moment is to collect data when people join a community. Because if you collect data when people join a community, then you can measure that a year later or six months later, and you have some idea of what the impact of that community is. You can compare members to non-members over the same time frame and start getting very specific about what the value of that community is. The technical term for this is the difference in differences approach. And again, we find when we look at the data that communities, they naturally attract people with a higher net promoter score. That's kind of interesting. But when you compare members to non-members over a year, the data is kind of interesting, but it's a little bit messy. But when we subtract the former from the latter, the non-members from the uh, newcomers, what we find is that overall, it does seem like the community is driving higher net promoter scores. But it's messy. All data is messy. And in fact, one of the easiest ways to look at data that isn't real is how clean it is. Data is generally messy. But you can see there is a huge impact here. The problem with the net promoter score, do you know what it is? What's the biggest issue with the net promoter score? Anyone? There are a few answers here. I'm not sure anyone quite get it. The problem is that people find it very different to tell the difference between the satisfaction with the company and the satisfaction with the community. So it becomes very challenging for people to distinguish between the two. And often, the question just doesn't make sense. Like when people really look at it, the question just doesn't make sense in many different situations. So what we need, really, is a better approach to this. What we need is an approach that is kind of uses the adaptability and the flexible nature of this, but it's a question that's designed for us. And this is where I want to introduce community-driven impact. I think there's a way of doing this a lot better and to show the real value of our work. And it works like this. First, we calculate the average member impact, which is the average measurable impact directly caused by the community on each visitor. And there's many different ways of looking at that. You can look at that in the behavioral level, or you can look at that at the attitudinal level. And so what we have to think about here is that communities do change attitudes. But people don't stay for the entire journey, and that's perfectly OK. What we do want to look at is how far do they come on that journey? So for example, a lot of people, especially in a lot of brand communities or support communities, they visit that community when they're at their moment of peak frustration and they leave when they're slightly happy. So for example, I might visit the HP community because my printer isn't working, and I might be furious. And then I might get an answer, or I might find out there isn't an answer, and I'm not delighted, but I'm less furious than what I was, and that's a useful impact to the community. Other times, people join in a more neutral state, and then they become happier as a result. I might join the mural community, for example, not because the product is hard to use, but I'm looking for new ideas or templates or inspiration. So we might join in a neutral state and then become more happier over time. And what we want to be tracking is what is the distance between these things? If we collect data when people arrive or when they leave or we'll track it over time, these are the kind of things that we can measure. That's the measurable impact of a community. And we often find that attitude data is the best and most persuasive data internally. Sure, people want to know the ROI, but almost no one is actually using it. 
when we look at brand attitude, brand perception, brand preference, or if you're for a nonprofit, uh, the quality of life score, these kind of metrics and questions are really interesting because we can ask people questions when they join, and then we can compare it to their answers later on in that community, six months, a year later, however long makes sense, and then we can look at the results. And I absolutely love, whether it's for a um, for-profit or non-profit organization, I love being able to go to a client and present them with data that's like this. Data that shows what the impact of a community is over a period of time. Data that shows that as a result of the community, they, people think our staff are friendlier, or it's helping them achieve their results, or they're getting good, docu or good documentation. Interestingly, value for, for, for money drops, I can't explain why. D data is like that at times. But it's amazing to have this kind of data. The challenge with this is that it's very hard to do in practice, because collecting data when people join and a year later, it's kind of complicated. You can do it, but there might be an easier question we can ask, which is to take the flexibility of the net promoter score and adapt it to a simple behavioral question, which is this. On a scale of 0 to 10, how has the community influenced whatever outcome you're, like, you're aiming for? On a scale of 1 to 10, you can survey, poll, or ask your members, how has the community influenced your likelihood to, say, renew your subscription? How has it influenced your likelihood to achieve your goals? What kind of results? So, I mean, any question that makes sense. Because imagine, imagine if you could go to your boss tomorrow and say, 43% of our members said the community had a decisive impact on their decision to renew their subscription. Sure, members might not always know the truth, and they might not be able to describe their behaviors in an accurate way, but that's also true for net promoter score and lots of other measures that are in place. So we can adapt this question however we need. How has the community influenced your likelihood to utilize any feature of the product, uh, influence your results, influence or not influence your decision to purchase? You can even use it as a call deflection measure if you like. But what this does is that it takes a causation issue away from us and lets members highlight what they think. And again, it might not always be super accurate, but it's just as accurate, if not more so, than net promoter score, customer sat satisfaction, and any of these kinds of measures. And it's a really simple metric we can use where we can track the average member impact over time. And what we see is that it does fluctuate a lot. You need around 200 to 300 responses. So if you can't do that each month, don't do it each month. Do it each quarter, do it each um, half, uh, twice a year. Do it what makes sense to you. But over time, it smooths out, and you can see what the impact of that community is. And then finally, we can get the community-driven impact. This is a lot easier. This is where we take the average impact upon each member, and then we multiply it by the number of people that visit the community. I think two years ago, or three years ago, I gave a talk about the engagement trap, about why it's so bad just to measure the, lev the level of engagement. And that's what I meant, and I think some people took it as don't measure engagement at all. But the issue with that is that you could have a really popular community or really uh, impactful community of just 10 members, and that AMI, or that average member impact, would be really high, but it's not big enough. So we have to balance these things against one another. And so, for example, an average member impact score of uh, 2.7 multiplied by 10,000 people that are visiting, that's a community-driven impact or a CDI score of 27K. If it sounds like we're getting a little bit technical here, it's really not that complicated at all. But if the AMI is 4.1, 4, 4 we've got 7,000 people that are visiting, now it's 28.7. And now we have a score that we can track over time, a score that establishes at least some level of causation, a score that is not difficult to implement at all, a score that really represents the value of our work. And you can see over time what the impact of that is. And you can see that we have to balance the people that are visiting and the impact the community has on them but you can see and track a result over time, which I think maybe could be a game changer for some of us in this audience today. And so it's not that hard to collect this data. I think for any metric to be successful, it has to be easy to use. And if you know what you're doing, it's not that difficult to do. And if you don't, honestly, we're willing to help. There's other people that are willing to help set up this system for you. But fundamentally, what we really want to be doing is focusing all our efforts on maximizing the impact of our community. What we want to be doing with every decision we make, every technology decision, recruitment decision, um, event decision, activity decision, anything that we do, we want to know, does it increase and improve the impact of that community? Because if we focus on this, 
then we know that we're having a community and doing work that's going to have the biggest possible impact upon members in that community, and it's going to have the biggest possible impact for the organizations that we work for. And I think if this succeeds, I think it's going to be a game changer for all of us. CMX, thank you so much. Thank you.